All right. Good morning, Cedarville. Let's pray and we'll dive into this word. Father, we come to you today and we admit you are an infinite God and we are finite. You are all powerful and we are so weak and so needy of you and your strengthening. You know all things, Father. Our, our knowledge is so limited. Lord, you are a great and awesome and amazing God. And we are a needy people, in need of you. And so we come today to your word and we pray that you would work through this word in our hearts to strengthen us for the sake of loving others, for the sake of growth in godliness. Lord, in this time, do great work in that way, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, if you have Bibles, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, we'll go to three passages in this book eventually, but we'll start in 2 Corinthians 1. I want to be strong. I don't mean bench press strong. I'm fully aware I'm never going to attain a whole lot of strength in that realm of life like some of you have, or my good colleague, Trent Rogers. No, I mean, I want to be seen as strong in general. Uh, to be the one who, when I'm looked at, it looks as though that's a person whose life is put together, who is sinning less and less, whose devotional times are always epic, who has ever-increasing wells of wisdom, who is in and of myself, strong. And that last phrase is especially deadly. In and of myself. What a sinful, God-belittling desire. Self-sufficiency is our enemy. It should be foreign to the Christian life, and yet it's all too pervasive in our lives and our thinking, and oftentimes we're not even aware of it. There are days that go by where I come to work and do my thing and teach classes and have meetings and talk to students and walk home, and on that walk home, I think how often or how, how much did I actually pray to God in the course of this given day? And we can be really clear in saying this, prayerlessness is a sign of self-sufficiency. Prayerlessness is me saying, God, I've got this. And that's a joke for all of us. I have three signs in my office, if you've ever been there. They're all hanging next to each other. One is a fairly famous quote from uh, Teddy Roosevelt called The Man in the Arena. It says this, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. It's a good inspirational quote. It's, a, it's a, I think, a very American quote in many ways. Uh, it can tend to get towards a pretty me-centered, man-centered, achievement-centered sort of ideology. So I want to say that that's, that's good in some senses, but not so much. I, I like the call to persevere and not fear failure because, don't get me wrong, we, we need gritty people in our day, no doubt about it. But that quote can play to my fleshly self-sufficiency. So I put two signs next to that quote intentionally. And they're not even really signs, they're just verses. 
And the verses are this. The first one is 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 15, 10, which says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. And then the other, 1 Peter 4, 10 and 11 says, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as it were the very oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves in the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever, amen. That's there in my office to remind me, strive, work hard unto God's glory and you're only gonna be able to be strengthened to work hard because God will empower you to do so by his grace. I need to be reminded of that. Not to be self-sufficient, but God dependent. I wanna persevere in the faith and do ministry in ways that'll be impactful on others for their growth in godliness, you do too. But I will never do that as a self-sufficient, independent, I've got this on my own kind of approach. It's grace, grace, grace that's sustaining us. It's serving in the strength that God supplies, which means we're going to say again and again and again, Lord, I am weak. I am helpless. Apart from you, I can do nothing, John 15, 5 says. And then we're going to constantly and desperately go to God in prayer. We're gonna trust the truths of his word and then by the spirit of God and the grace of God, we're gonna operate in our days by his power. That's the call. And that's the call of of 2 Corinthians, which has this truth. Paul resolves his conflict in this book with the Corinthians by showing how the reality of Christ's death and resurrection turns our value systems and priorities upside down. It's in Paul's weakness that God shows his strength. And in that strength, in in God's strength, Paul can minister then to others. In the same way, we are needy. And we live in that kind of posture before God and recognize that by his grace, we come to him as needy people receiving strength because on the flip side, we are needed. God has ordained that you and I minister to other people. We come to him needy, receiving strength and grace from him to then give forth needful ministry to others. That's the pattern. We come needy, we get strengthened, and we get strengthened for the sake of other people around us. So the main idea of this this message is the same main idea as is for the whole book of 2 Corinthians, and it's this. God shows his power through weakness. God shows his power through weakness. So we need to embrace that truth. It's not a typical thing we want to embrace. No one wants to speak of their weaknesses, but it's in our weaknesses we see that God is glorified in his strength and it's about his being glorified in our lives, not our own glory in these ways. So a few things here. Chapter one, first point we're gonna think through is this. Don't rely on yourself, rely on God. Don't rely on yourself, rely on God. Verse three, chapter one. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort too. If we're afflicted, it's for your comfort and salvation. And if we're comforted, it's for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same suffering that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Now, Bible study 101, one key thing you're looking for in Bible study is repeated words. So in this paragraph, in case you missed it, key word, comfort, okay? 
God comforts us in our affliction, Paul's saying here. He comforts us as we need to be comforted. He is the father of mercies who comforts us in all of our afflictions. Same exact word Jesus uses in John 14 through 16 to describe the Holy Spirit as our comforter. God grants this to us. He grants peace and comfort to us in the midst of our affliction. God does not always aim to remove us from difficulty. That is not always his aim for you. He does not always intend to remove us from difficulty, but he does grant us peace and comfort in the midst of it as we look to him in dependence. It could be in your life right now, you're saying, God, just get me out of this circumstance, please. And God would say to you, I'm not granting that request, but I will grant you comfort and peace in this moment. You know what I'm talking about? It's that unexplainable peace, that incredible comfort that people think is strange and misplaced in the midst of what you're facing. It, it's the person who handles the diagnosis of cancer with grief, but with trust and with composure. They are knowing and experiencing God's comfort. It's the student who's doing 18 credits, working 20 plus hours a week, paying for college basically on their own and working hard to minister to others and be in relationships. Some of you can relate to this. They're working and there's a calm in their work. It's stacking up, but there's a restfulness that's there because they're experiencing God's comfort in that affliction. It's watching my own parents walk through affliction with amazing grace. It's watching the elders at my church work hard amidst complicating circumstances. It's seeing my own kids this past year which may seem small to some in the room, but my own kids this year, this past year, in the spring, my daughter was in a play, that got canceled. This fall, Jonathan plays soccer. Season, canceled. And watching them walk through that with grace. There are hard moments, but they know, we know our God and know his peace and his comfort in these ways. And this comfort, look at verse four, this comfort is given by God uh, so that, middle of the verse, verse four, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. We're given comfort by God so that we can comfort others with the comfort we receive from God. Paul knows that in ministry, and, and all of us have a ministry, he suffers afflictions and experiences God's comfort, and this is the normal Christian life. He even says that whether we're afflicted or comforted, it's for other people's comfort. He's got a really others-centered mentality here. As such, he seeks to minister comfort to those who are in affliction, reassuring them of the trustworthy character of God. And then he goes on, verse eight. We do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength, we despaired of life itself. Some moment in Paul's ministry where it is getting bad, really, really hard. Indeed, verse nine, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. That's many moments in Paul's ministry, but somewhere in here, Paul's saying, this is it. Like, we, we are on the verge of being done with life, period. And those can be dark moments, friends. And here's the main point of this first point we're trying to get through. See in verse nine, but... That, that sentence of death, that hard time in ministry, that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. God puts you in scenarios wherein you have no other option than to look to him. That's what he's doing in our lives. In Paul's life, he's saying, I'm putting you here in this scenario such that you would recognize, you would recognize and verse nine again, it says, to rely not myself, ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. 
I have not done that recently, just so you know. And I oftentimes look to me to rely on me and my strength, my resources, my know-how to get through life. And God's saying, um, I raised the dead. Why don't you look this way and depend on the one who can raise the dead. So we rely on our, not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. God delivered them before, he will do so again. So Paul seems to understand our default posture, even as Christians, is self-sufficiency. We, we tend toward this all the time. Relying on ourselves will either result in pride for a time or eventually weariness, despair, ruin. So I want to encourage us, friends. Let's admit to God, I'm weak. In and of myself, I don't have a whole lot of strength to offer anything or anyone. Let's slow down. I need to hear that. Let's slow down. Let's pray. Really, desperately, depending on God, pray. Let's look to his word and trust his promises. Let's abide in Christ. Let's live in the sustaining grace and strength that he supplies. Pray for grace and get to work. Pray for grace and then get to work in his power, relying on him for strength and the results. And let's be sure that we see our weaknesses and afflictions in a context of opportunities to serve others in the strength that God gives to us. We're weak. We get strengthened by God, not to just get strengthened for ourselves, but for the sake of loving others. Don't rely on yourself. Rely on God. Second, go to chapter four of 2 Corinthians. Chapter four. Know that surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Know that surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Us. Now, chapters three and four in 2 Corinthians describe the ministry of the new covenant that we now live out as followers of Jesus. If you have me as a professor, you've heard numerous times about the covenants in the Bible with Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, David, and the new covenant. So Paul's explaining here new covenant realities. The veil, he says later on, has been removed from our eyes spiritually. We have seen the light of the gospel of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's chapter four, verses four and six. Seeing Jesus, we embrace him by faith and we're saved. And now uh, 318 of this book says, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into that same image from one degree of glory to another. And because we have this ministry of the new covenant, he says in verse 16 of chapter four, we don't lose heart. We don't lose heart. Again, in verse seven of this chapter, chapter four, so four, seven, Paul says this, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Now in context, we have this treasure. What treasure? Well, in context, he's just discussed the gospel, the glory of God in the face of Christ. We have that treasure, gospel, new covenant treasure. In jars of clay, it says. So there it's this idea of the treasure of the gospel and gospel ministry and new covenant realities contained in our human frailty, our human bodies, our capacities. And this again shows how much we need him. We have this treasure, again, in our bodies that are very finite, very fragile, to show God has surpassing power. Not you, not me. He has the power. What the earthen vessel contains is the only thing that gives it importance. Jars of clay in that day were not very valuable. It's like Aladdin, people, okay? The lamp is not all that special. It's what's inside the lamp that makes that pretty amazing when the genie comes out. Listen. We are jars of clay. We are not that impressive. <laughs> no matter how polished, athletic, intelligent, strong as we may be, we're not impressive compared to an infinite God. That's just the way it is. And yet, 
God has chosen to instill us with significance and purpose as he gives us life and salvation and ministry all through the gospel. We fulfill that gospel purpose and gospel ministry in reliance on his extraordinary power. And again, it reminds us the surpassing power for my life, for my ministry belongs to God and not to me. I'm reliant on him. He goes on in verse eight, check this out. He says, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus. Why? so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, Paul says, and life, or but life in you. Paul's saying again here, his affliction bestows benefits for others by producing not only comfort, but it says here, producing life in others. Affliction will come. This is a pattern. Affliction will come. You will manifestly feel your weakness. And God is beckoning us, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest and comfort and strength. And we go to him in prayer, trusting in his truths and his word, saying, God, I can't do this. Help me to get outside of myself to receive your strengthening power to love others, to grant life in Christ to them by your grace. He does this, end of the chapter, in amazing ways where he says, He looks at things not that are seen, but are unseen. So don't lose heart. Our inner selves being renewed day by day, knowing the slight momentary afflictions of life are preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. We see life in that way. Suffering and trial and affliction will not leave us in this life. Nor will God strengthen in power if we go to him in dependence. In dependence. Two words, going to him again and again. We have the treasure of the gospel in jars of clay, our bodies, and this shows God has surpassing power, not us. So thank God for the gospel. Thank God for his amazing power. Then avail yourself of that power by admitting your weakness before God and by praying humbly and desperately and trusting in the truths of his word and serving in his strength for the sake of others. This is a pattern of the Christian life. It's a mindset. It's a constant remembrance of God going to him and seeking him for strength for others. Beware then of God amnesia. Beware of the moments where you just go through life. I just go through life and things are going fine. Or even when it's hard, we're just reliant on me, me, me. And God amnesia is set in. And to say, he's there. He's waiting to strengthen those who come to him. And so we need to go and not give way to God amnesia, but to say every day, every hour, every moment I'm coming to him, short moments, longer moments in prayer, but I'm depending on him. How many times have I walked to a class to teach students feeling unbelievably inadequate to do so and just saying before walking through that door, Lord, help me. It's just a cry of a man who says, I can't do anything in my own power. Help me, please. This is life all the way through. And then third, turn to chapter 12. Turn to chapter 12 in 2 Corinthians. This third point here, see that God's grace and power are sufficient for you. So don't rely on yourself, rely on God, and then see the surpassing uh, power belongs to God, not to us. And then see that God's grace and power are sufficient 
for you? Can God come through? Is his grace and his strengthening sufficient? I feel so weak and so tired and so stressed. Can God actually empower me enough to do this or that or the other? He's God. Yes, his resources toward you and I are infinite. Chapter 12, well-known chapter. Paul's beginning to defend his apostolic ministry starting in chapter 10 of this book because they're enamored with false teachers. And he starts comparing his credentials, Paul does, with these so-called super apostles here first in the Mass. And, and Paul does a strange thing. He keeps on, as they refer to their strengths, he keeps on appealing to his weaknesses. That's bad for a resume, right? That's a bad way to build a resume. He keeps going toward his weaknesses. It's a strange tactic. And in 12.1, Paul introduces a new topic of boasting, he calls it, about visions and revelations from the Lord. He describes being caught up into paradise and seeing amazing things. Then he narrates the results of that vision. And then he speaks of this really well-known thorn in the flesh. Verse 7. So, to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. And then in verse 8, he says, three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. So he's pleading, God, take this pain, whatever it is, this pain, limitation, weakness, whatever it is, take this from me. I get that prayer. I understand that prayer. God, please remove that painful thing. And God in his sovereignty says no. He says there's, there's good to come from this thorn, Paul. And not good like we often describe it in our own minds, like being comfortable, but good as in uh, Romans 8, 28 and 29, where he says he works all things for good in terms of being conformed to the image of his son, being made like Jesus. I have good to accomplish in that way through this thorn, Paul, in your life. The answer is no. The thorn exists to keep Paul, verse seven, from arrogance. After seeing what he's seen, he concludes by stating the real significance of his weaknesses. See verse nine, look at verse nine. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. And here's why. For when I am weak, then... I am strong. God's power is made perfect in Paul's weakness, my weakness, your weakness. Paul learns this thorn will not hamper his calling. He can continue to minister because of the grace he's already received and will keep on receiving and the power of Christ will become more visible as it works through his weakness. And the same goes for us. As God works strength into us in the midst of our weaknesses, people don't say, wow, Kimball's strong. They say, wow, God is strengthening that guy, that woman they see, they, they know, how could you be in yourself strong? I couldn't be. There's an external strength coming in this moment to me that allows me to do what I do in terms of ministry. He's learning to die so that Christ can live through him by faith. Galatians 2 verse 20. The thorn makes him acutely aware of his own inadequacies and prevents him from thinking that he is equal to the task alone. He is not, we are not. It prevents an inflated ego from crowding out the power of God in his life. See, this whole teaching in Corinthians crushes ego, crushes pride. And we all need that. Paul now 
reveals why he's so willing to boast in his weakness rather than to pray for the removal of the thorn. His weakness becomes the vehicle by which God's grace and Christ's power is fully manifested in his life for the sake of others. He says, okay, I get it. That can remain so that I keep coming to you humbly, relying on you, getting empowered to minister effectively to other people in love. I get it. And the prayer is that we'd get that as well. When I was a lifeguard many years ago, uh, there were times I had to rescue people out of the pool. And at, at that moment, I needed them to recognize, okay, you are weak and I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit stronger here, so just chill out and let me help you in this moment. Don't, don't try to fight what I'm trying to do. And some people in their panic, wow, and they're just flailing and fighting and doing all these things. In fact, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, my family was at a pool nearby and my kids thought this would be fun. They're like, hey, daddy, come to the deep end and rescue us and we'll be panicked swimmers. And I'm like, okay. So, so they're there and like, they're flailing, they're hitting me, kicking, all this stuff, trying to make it as hard as they could uh, to prevent me from getting to the side of the pool in all good fun. And then they both did it, like do both at once. I'm like, okay. So trying to do both of them at one time and they're, they're punching and kicking and flailing around and I'm trying to, trying to grab them and like, stop, don't do that, you know. It, this is what we do sometimes in life. People struggling in their own quote unquote strength makes it more difficult for the lifeguard. They might think it helps, but it does not at all. If Paul boasted in his own strength, thinking that by himself he was equal to any task or any calamity, he would cancel out the power of God in his life. He's got to recognize I'm in need, like that, like that panicked swimmer, I'm in need and I'm saying to you, help. I want to receive your strength and in this moment. I want, to, I want to receive your strength. He's therefore more powerful, most powerful, when he's re least reliant on his own resources and most dependent on God. That's where strength comes from. So grace is unmerited favor and salvation? Yes. Is it also sustaining power throughout our lives? Yes. Trials, difficulties, and limitations are going to beset us. We're, we're, we're in a room that is unusual in terms of who's in here, how are we in here. We're in the midst of hard moments. This is not going to change for us in this world. We will have affliction of various kinds in our lives. That's a guarantee. We have to die to the need to change our circumstances. We've got to die to the need to say, if you, God, if you just changed this, then I'd be okay. God's saying, I love you and I want you to recognize in this circumstance, my grace can come, my strength can come, my comfort can come in such a way that you are empowered in this difficult circumstance to make a difference in the lives of others. This is what he does every single day. We're not just trying to escape trial. We're trying to receive God in trial for the sake of others. That's the mentality. That is hard to get to, but that's the mentality we want to get towards. We are all needy. It's only recognizing this that we can minister to others and receive from others as we need to. We minister, we receive, we do these things. I mean, to even just in this room, two of my very best friends are sitting in the front row of this room. I love these men. And later today, we're going to sit down somewhere. I'm not sure where. We'll find out later on. Uh, somewhere today. And, and talk and encourage one another. I need to hear the word of God from them to me. Here's truth from God. Pray for me. All these things. We do this not alone. We do all these things in the context of community. Together. That's the call. So God shows his power through our weakness. That's 2 Corinthians 1, 9, 4, 7, 12, 9, and 10. Really a thread throughout the whole book of 2 Corinthians. We are needy. But make no mistake, in your dependence on God, he aims to empower you so you can love others selflessly and sacrificially. 
His grace is sufficient to do so, to get outside of yourself and serve others in this way. As we live in that kind of posture before God, we recognize that by his grace, we are needed and can be used by him in the lives of others, in the context of community, in the context of the local church, in the midst of a suffering, hurting, needy world. So friends, recognize your need. Pray constantly and desperately. Trust the truths and promises you see in his word and in the strength that he supplies. Serve in love. Father, help us to live out that pattern of the Christian life. Give us the grace to do so, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks so much. You're dismissed.